hard work, passion, and dedication. Disability impacts everyone, and our work reminds us that we are all temporarily able-bodied. Although one in four Americans are disabled, their shared experiences are often without an identity in France. Dr. Garland Thompson's expertise has allowed the world to become a more inclusive place. If we listen to Dr. Garland Thompson's words, we can become more thoughtful, passionate, and stronger advocates for society and ourselves. Dr. Garland Thompson wrote, disability communication for suffering, but it can also be an occasion for joy, knowledge, and connection. It is clear that her work has embodied and embraced these relationships and emotions. With that, please join me in welcoming Dr. Rosemary Garland Thompson of Boston College.
comprehensive, accessible learning environment in the work that I do. And so this evening, I'm bringing to you as, an, as accessible an environment as I can manage uh, using the built-in designed environment in the space that we're in, which is itself accessible in its ways, using the practices of presentation that we typically use, for example, a microphone which creates what I call a robust auditory environment, um, and I'm using the principle of access and inclusion, which is multiple forms or multiple formats. So tonight I'll be presenting basically in two formats. One will be an auditory format. I'm going to speak to you, uh, reading my paper, because I want to be very deliberate about what I say to you this evening. And the other format that I will be using is a visual format. These are designed to function as augmentations of one another, but to function independently, so that one could gather enough information from the auditory presentation for this to be effective, and one could theoretically gather enough from the visual presentation without the auditory presentation for it to be reasonably effective. Now, there are other formats that could be included and sometimes are. For example, we could have a sign language, American Sign Language version of this presentation. We're not doing that this evening, in part, I presume, because no one requested it. Um, but oftentimes, that is one format in uh, any kind of an academic uh, presentation. Another format that is actually very effective, um, and that is real-time captioning or live captioning in which the words that are spoken tumble up, you maybe have seen it, on a screen uh, through um, a real-time entering, uh, text entering, um, and there is then a transcript of the event. We actually, I guess we're not having that. Sometimes uh, with academic presentations, there'll be, ah, oh, there we are, a recording. And this recording will be <coughs> one format of access to the presentation this evening that will be, I presume, available. So I'm calling that uh, set of access, access, my talk to text software always calls it excess instead of access, which people like. Um, I want to call attention to this accessible learning environment uh, because very often we don't notice when it's going on. So I hope it's effective for you. So, I want us to imagine here together this evening what kind of world we might want to build and inhabit together. And I'm going to begin by what I call a moral genealogy that's initiated I want to make sure I've got the right slides. That's initiated by Hannah Arendt, who concluded in her 1965 book on the Holocaust called Eichmann and in Jerusalem, a report on the banality of evil, that political regimes ought not to determine, and I quote Arendt, who should and should not inhabit the world. Echoing Hannah Arendt in 1990, the biologist Ruth Hubbard, who just passed away recently, Harvard biologist, cautions us against the hubris of determining what counts as a livable life. Scientists and physicians in this and other countries, Hubbard warns, are once more engaged in developing the means to decide what lives are worth living and who should and should not inhabit the world. Now, completing this moral genealogy, the writer Nancy Mayers declares in her 1996 book called Waste High in the World, A Life Among the Non-Disabled, and this is a great title. Nancy Mayers is a wheelchair user. 
that her task in writing about living with multiple sclerosis is, and I quote, to conceptualize not merely a habitable body, but a habitable world, a world that wants me in it. I'm going to follow this evening Arendt, Hubbard, and Mayers by asserting that the shape of the material world that we build and occupy together expresses and determines who inhabits it. That's my main thesis. I'll make the case for building a world that wants disabled people, a world that accommodates rather than eliminates the inherent human variations that we think of as disabilities. And I'll suggest to you how we can use technologies from tools to stories to make a shared world inhabited by the widest range of human users. This world will strengthen the cultural, political, institutional, and material climate in which people with disabilities can most effectively flourish. So I'll offer to you a case for what I call and have called in my bioethics work, conserving disability. Disability, as a concept and a lived experience, provides human communities with multiple opportunities, <coughs> I want to suggest, for expression, creativity, resourcefulness, and relationships. Because disability is inherent in the human condition, we should recognize, I argue, what we gain from disability and what we lose when we eliminate disability from our shared world. My aim here, then, is to bring forward the cultural and the material contributions that disability offers to the self and to the world. My case for conserving visibility, then, involves the idea of preserving intact, keeping alive, and even encouraging to flourish that is denoted by the verb conserve. As resources to be conserved, the ways of being that we think of as disabilities can be reimagined as benefits rather than deficits, as opportunities rather than limitations. The human variations that we think of as disabilities are, of course, persistent and enduring forms of human biodiversity. They are evidence of our enduring sturdiness rather than our fragility or our vulnerability. Now, my case here uses conservation in the strict sense of conserving, preserving, protecting, and affirming an entity that benefits and belongs to the community in a way that is named by environmentalist conservation or historic preservation, for example. We are all made from flesh, blood, bone, and this enfleshment, it's one of my favorite words, sets the limits of our existence. A conservationist approach toward human embodied existence recognizes then and honors that materiality by providing a sustained, sustaining environment that allows human body flourishing. Conserving disability in this way then affirms human body variation and human distinctiveness. It seeks to sustain more than transform. It invests more in the is than the ought. Disability conservation then promotes and protects human biodiversity and it honors what the poet Kesky Papers here. Gerard Manley Hopkins calls dappled things. Now, a habitable shared world, and this is the word that I'm trying to launch here, habitable, <coughs> promotes what Valerie Fletcher, director of the Institute for Human Centered Design here in Boston, calls social sustainability. We need to design environments that anticipate a spectrum of embodiments, Fletcher tells us, so as to enhance everyone's well-being and everyone's performance. Such sustainable environments provide a material context of received and built things 
ranging from excessively designed, built public spaces, welcoming natural surroundings, communication devices, tools and implements, as well as, of course, other people. For humans to thrive, we need to be ensconced in an environment that sustains the particular form, function, and needs of our bodies. Access involves the encounter, then, between bodies with particular shapes and capabilities and the particular shape and structure of the world. An accessible world is a sustainable world. This aspirational goal, then, of creating an inclusive, sustaining environment is to provide equal access to a democratic public sphere comprised of open, integrated institutions such as the workplace, the marketplace, media, transportation, and public institutions such as schools, healthcare centers, archives, and governmental spaces. Inclusive world building, which I've spoken about before, integrates diverse populations into public spaces by creating an accessible barrier-free material environment. An accessible, an accessible, sustainable environment creates social diversity and it support, supports the civil and human rights-based understandings of disability that are encoded in legislation such as the Americans with Disabilities Act of 1990 and 2009 and broader initiatives such as the United Nations Treaty on the Rights of People with Disabilities all of which aim to integrate people with disabilities as full citizens and community members. So like environmentalist ethics, which I've laid out somewhat, disability conservationist ethics then focuses on creating this supportive material context, a kind of moral ecosystem in which human embodied existence can successfully thrive as it is to conserve the human variations that we think of as disabilities does not preclude, and this is important, appropriate interventions, sometimes medical, sometimes social, that ameliorate pain and suffering or promote human functioning and flourishing. Conserving disability also includes using technology as a bridge between flesh and world. Disability conservationism, then, is not a static acceptance of the status quo. It's not passive fatalism or a reductive <coughs> non-intervention policy. Rather, it is a caution against an aggressive normalization imperative that eliminates rather than accommodates. It works against the arrogance of what the writer Chimimanda Adichie calls the danger of a single story. Instead, human biodiversity conservation, as I offer it here, finds its essence in the concept of active accommodation that's fundamental to the disability rights movement. Change the environment, not the person. Protect rather than regularize, abide rather than improve, accommodate rather than eliminate. This intellectual and ethical project thus makes the case for disability and it mounts a case against the neoliberal eugenic arguments of utilitarian bioethicists such as Peter Singer. So far here this evening, <coughs> I've laid out the ways that the designed and built environment can make what I'm calling habitable worlds for all of us to live in. Now, for the remainder of my talk, and here comes the medical humanities, I'm going to turn from material technologies that I've been discussing to suggest how what I'm calling narrative technologies might create habitable worlds for us to occupy together. To do so, what I'm going to present to you, and this is the practice of narrative bioethics or disability bioethics, 
I'm going to offer what I call guided, a guided reading that I've written to accompany a series of narratives, actually, by people with disabilities that show us perspectives that make the case for conserving disability and suggests how story might make world. So the guided reading that I'm going to offer you for the remainder of my talk consists of what I call applied literary criticism. Now my purpose for these guided readings is to act as accompaniments to collections of narratives that are and that exist and are being studied and used by healthcare professionals, bioethicists, medical clinicians, and students in medical or health humanities. And Amy's work has contributed to these narratives um, in important ways. And the purpose, of course, of these guided readings is to help persuade policymakers and practitioners of my case for conserving disability. So, what I'm going to offer you then this evening is a critical guide through Harriet McBride Johnson's 2003 New York Times Magazine article called Unspeakable Conversations. And I'm showing here a slide that has an image cover of the New York Times Magazine in 2002 with Harriet McBride Johnson seated in her wheelchair on the cover of the magazine. And I'll talk a little bit more about the cover of the magazine um, in a few minutes. So Harriet McBride Johnson's story, I want to suggest, shows us what the bioethicist Jackie Leach Scully calls thinking through the variant body which is a way of knowing the world that is shaped by the distinctive experience of living the embodied human existence that we think of as disability. Johnson, Harry McBride Johnson's knowledge-producing perspective thus yields unique ways of knowing produced by interacting with a world that is not fully built to accommodate her. My guided reading shows the way that the interwoven narrative elements of illusion, point of view, voice, setting, character, incident, and dialogue, these are classic, basic elements of narrative, function cumulatively to make a strong claim for conserving disability. Johnson's article, and now I'm beginning here, Johnson's article, to explain, is a first-person account of her two formal, professional, public encounters with Princeton University's endowed professor of ethics, the utilitarian moral philosopher and bioethicist, Peter Singer, who I'm showing here. Johnson was a wheelchair-using disability rights lawyer advocate and activist who worked in li and lived, she's uh, passed away now, in Charleston, South Carolina. Singer's influential scholarship has steadfastly argued for killing disabled newborns as a recent ethical utilitarian principle. Narrative, this is the, set, the next uh, section of my um, talk. Narrative technologies for building habitable worlds. So, as promised, the first narrative technology is illusion. So my guided reading of Johnson's case study begins with illusion, one of the most economical and stealthy of rhetorical devices. Illusion uses in-group references to pack in meaning and to gain authoritative <coughs> narrative authority by referring outside the text to other conversations. Johnson begins her story with a pre-story that appears as a headline on the cover of the New York Times Magazine. Her provocative rhetorical question that is printed across her wheelchair on the image of her using her wheelchair on the cover of the New York Times Magazine says, 
should I have been killed at birth? This question, this rhetorical question, is both an allusion to and a displacement of Peter Singer's equally provocative 1985 book title, Should the Baby Live? Colon, the problem of handicapped infants. And I'm showing an image of that book cover juxtaposed with the image of the New York Times Magazine cover in which Johnson's story appears. In this book, Singer makes the strongest argument for euthanizing disabled newborns. Now, from its beginning, Harriet McBride Johnson's story gives particularity to such abstract problem infants, that Singer's term, problem infants, by presenting her to her readers as a distinctive person, embedded in family, mutually satisfying interpersonal relations, and meaningful engagement with the world. She begins this by actually showing a picture of herself. The narrative convention of a dramatic first line in her story strengthens her self-presentation as a person rather than a case. Her opening declarative sentence in the article in the New York Times Magazine, which I'm showing here, is, he insists he doesn't want to kill me. It uses the bookended pronouns he and me, joined together by the active verb kill, to transform an abstract theoretical problem into a story of specific people in living relationships. Such introductory allusions establish Johnson's position of authority, both as an expert narrator and as a leading character. Point of view, as promised. With this first person narration, Johnson claims narrative privilege, and she presents a worldview from within the body and the life of the narrative I, the pronoun I. The controlling narrative perspective is thus always situated in a distinctive material place and time from which the knowing of the narrative radiates. By placing herself as both first person narrator and main character, Johnson makes herself the very center of the story, and she relegates all the other characters, including Peter Singer, to secondary positions. Indeed, by assigning Singer the position of the third person, he, Johnson contains his claims within her own story and her voice. The third person, as we know, is always the other of a narrative. And Singer becomes the third person of Johnson's narrative, similarly to the way that the disabled infant is the other of Singer's syllogistic argument for euthanasia. Her narrative thus reverses the usual cultural point of view in which the non-disabled perspective is normative and the disabled perspective is atypical and often not authoritative. So in relegating Singer to a third person character, Johnson's strong first person narration ventriloquizes Singer's claims. His ethical arguments and authoritative voice appear through Johnson's strong declarative translation. He wants, she writes, and I'm quoting, to legalize the killing of certain babies who might come to be like me if allowed to live. He also says he believes that it should be lawful under some circumstances to kill, at any age, individuals with cognitive impairments so severe that he doesn't consider them persons, close quote. Wielding the third-person pronoun, he, and the first-person pronouns, my and me, Johnson defangs Singer's point of view without ever quoting him directly. He says, she goes on, and I'm quoting her again, 
my family and my doctors might put me out of my misery, and no one would count it as murder. <coughs> Johnson's own succinct claim comes to us as a direct fact rather than a position. She says, and I quote, the presence or absence of disability doesn't predict quality of life, close quote. That's it. The story that she tells constitutes evidence to support this claim. Thus, Singer's words, his voice, and his point of view are really not present in Johnson's narrative. Her strategy of first-person narration has overtaken Singer's voice, rendering him absent in the way that he would render disabled people like her absent from the world. So Johnson's method is to show rather than to tell, and to do so with great narrative economy. To do this, she narrates a perpetual choreography of encounters between her and Singer that are rooted in a particular moment and a particular space. And I'm showing, as I move through here, a series of images of Johnson. And this is very intentional, because I want Johnson to be present in my presentation in the way she is present in her story, and for her to be visually present in the visual version of this um, presentation. Because we readers perceive Johnson's life and the world through her embodiment in the story, as if it were our own, Singer's awkwardness and outsider status become apparent to us as we read the story. We come to understand him not as the voice of objective truth, but rather as a situated person limited in his own knowing by his isolation from people with disabilities. Voice. Johnson's story puts forward two complementary yet contrasting voices that achieve specific and crucial aims. First is the storytelling voice, which establishes a relationship of identification with readers by suggesting that she is ordinary folk like them, embedded in a family and friends, a life of family and friends. She's a humorous person, someone who would be a generous and easygoing neighbor, friend, or family member. This ordinary storytelling voice then characterizes Johnson as a regular person to show that her lived experience as a person with a significant disability is not worse off, and I'm quoting the words worse off that she uses, worse off than singers. Worse off is the examined assumption about disabled lives that grounds singers' utilitarian logic for euthanizing disabled newborns. Johnson also mobilizes the authoritative voice and authoritative voice <clears throat> strategically to at once establish her credentials as a radical progressive, an erudite intellectual, a relaxed insider, and most important to differentiate herself from the typical earnest voice of disability advocacy. I think this is a really interesting strategy. So this slightly distancing voice, which I'll talk about a little bit more, <laughs> keeps her above partisanism and resentment. It positions her to mobilize the rhetoric of benevolent tolerance that she takes in the concluding scene of her narrative, which I'll explain a bit later. So next category, setting. Johnson's claim for the right to be present in the world comes in the form of vivid narrative particularity. Her words materialize a perpetual series of animated settings into which Johnson escorts her readers. Time and space are always specific. She tells us it's a chilly Monday in late March. It's five minutes before 10. Readers accompany her on rides in her wheelchair through Princeton University, the College of Charleston, into her accessible hotel room, the Newark Airport. By the way, her hotel room is the Christopher Reeves Suite. Johnson also prepares 
her peoples her story with descriptively embodied, richly enfleshed, mostly named characters who are situated in precise spaces and moments. We hear about Herb, Carmen, Beth, Sharon, the gate agent, a young man near the top of the room. In contrast, in singers, liberal eugenics, bodies are abstract absences, especially the vague, unwanted children that he would eliminate. In Johnson's story, however, in Johnson's story, however, Singer's individuality actually comes forward to us through her descriptions, displacing the authorial position of disembodied objectivity in his writing. So what Johnson calls the presentation of myself, those are her words, that is a necessary fact of her everyday life as a person with a disability, takes on in the story great authority. Johnson as character emerges through detailed self-description. And I'm quoting, to keep myself upright, she tells us, I lean forward, rest my rib cage on my lap, plant my elbows beside my knees. Since my backbone found its natural shape, I've been entirely comfortable in my skin. Ever narrating her own situated enfleshment, if you will, she reports to Singer that she's had a pleasant lunch and a very nice nap. This evidence of Johnson's material existence, her occupation and her navigation of physical space in a built environment asserts her presence in the world. Such an ontological narrative counters, of course, Singer's logic of disabled lives as problems to be solved through elimination. Incident. So the work of narrative is making coherent, a coherent causal account from the experience of random incidents ordered in time and space, but not in meaning. Johnson's plot is composed of incidents that give narrative form to her presence and particular ways of being in the world. These, I call them phenomenological incidents, detail body care, interpersonal touching, assistance, and navigation, and are distinctive to living with disabilities. These are Singer's worst off incidents, animated and narratively enfleshed in Johnson's story which witnesses a tenable life well lived, filled with ordinary pleasures and challenges. So I'm going to uh, provide you with some of these assistant, uh, some of these um, narratives, incidents, pardon me. So, <clears throat> first the care and assistance incidents show us assisted care routines that Johnson herself clearly directs. Here, her self-determination emerges mutually with her care provider, suggesting an interdependent form of autonomy. Johnson is the agent of her caregiving, even while her assistant, Carmen, enacts it. And I'm going to present, I've, I've quoted these particular incidents that I'm going to read to you um, on the screen here. So we have words, and we have an image, and then you have um, my words. To quote Johnson, I drive to the mirror, Johnson writes. I do my hair in one long braid. A big polyester scarf completes my costume. Carmen lays it over my back. I tie it the way I want it. And she's writing there about her preparation for uh, going to the uh, interview or to the conversation with Singer. But she also has the same outfit on the uh, cover of the New York Times magazine. So she has her hair in one long braid and she has a scarf um, laid over her back. Another incident of mutual care that I will quote. Johnson's words. I let myself be propped up to eat oatmeal and drink tea. Then there's the bedpan and the bathing and the dressing still in bed. Carmen lifts me up into my chair and straps 
a rolled towel under my ribs for comfort and stability. She switches on my motors and gives me the means of moving without anyone's help. They don't call it a power chair for nothing. Johnson also shows that in mutual caregiving, that mutual caregiving operates between disabled and non-disabled people routinely. She recruits Singer in a reciprocal care arrangement <coughs> in which he assists her in her movement and she assists him in his understanding. And I quote, a little while later, my right elbow slips out from under me. This is awkward. I gesture to Singer. He leans over and I whisper, grasp this wrist and pull it forward one inch without lifting. He follows my instructions to the letter. And now he understands what I was saying a minute ago, that most of the assistance disabled people need does not demand medical training. Close quote. These scenes of mutual assistance highlight interpersonal touching, along with the verbal interaction, as an embodied form of relation that is characteristic of living with disability. The need for assistance, of course, is one aspect of disabled life that justifies what some bioethicists call a deficit model of existence, the worse off assumption that grounds Singer's rationale for euthanizing disabled infants. Yet Singer, Johnson makes clear, relies on his own assistant. In a choreography of reciprocal navigation, each of their assistants contributes to the mutual task of getting around. In their trip to Johnson's hotel, she tells us that Singer's assistant shows us to the elevator. In another journey across campus, she notes, he doesn't know how to get out of the building without using the stairs. So this time, it is my assistant, she says, who is leading the way. Here, the daily activity of navigating the built environment that is usually understood as a skill of the non-disabled becomes Johnson's expertise. So, conclusion. <coughs> This is Johnson's conclusion that I'm going to discuss with you, and then I'll have a conclusion. So with the story of her meeting with Peter Singer complete, Johnson moves from incident to exposition in her article with a contemplative, a high-minded meditation. Here she sidelines this folksy voice that we've had before and she adopts the rhetoric of the sage philosopher to give a distance and major reflection on Peter Singer. This is, in my view, Johnson's craftiest illusion, and that is the allusion to the tragic, the classic tragic hero. The tragic view, Johnson wisely observes, and I quote, comes closest, I'm going to quote a blank here, comes closest to describing how I now look at Peter Singer. He is a man of unusual gifts, reaching for the heights. He writes that he is trying to create a system of ethics derived from fact and reason that largely throws off the perspectives of religion, place, family, tribe, community, and maybe even species, to take the point of view of the universe is it's a grand heroic undertaking. But like the protagonist in a classical drama, Johnson goes on, he has his flaw. And it is the unexamined assumption that disabled people are inherently worse off, that we suffer, that we have lesser prospects of a happy life, close quote. Having pronounced Singer tragic, she accords him then with what she calls fellow feeling and human sympathy. In doing so, she positions herself narratively, of course, as the bestower of benevolence and sympathy, the tolerant one, which of, the, of course is the traditional 
able-bodied position of agency, knowledge, power, and benevolence directed at people with disabilities. Now this contemplative conclusion that I'm describing to you also sets up a final quotidian scene that Johnson narrates, and it allows her to consider, and this is complicated, but I want to try to explain it. The ethical question of whether Peter Singer should be considered an advocate of genocide. Okay, so this is an important ethical question. Is he an advocate of genocide? Is he a monster? So she sets this up by staging a scene in which she's talking to her sister Beth on the phone. So to maintain her position of generous benevolence that she's set up here for the tragic singer, Johnson does something interesting. She assigns the role of ethical judgment to her sister Beth in this phone call. So their phone chat is a form of Socratic questioning, if you will, and it examines the distinction between advocating killing and undertaking killing, which is a very important ethical differentiation. And in an imagined, and this is all a conversation with Beth and whether, and Beth's friends and what they think and what Beth thinks. So in this imagined exchange with her sister, afterward, Harriet Johnson, she puts down the phone and then she thinks about Beth conjuring up a kind of generalized you with whom the readers can identify because you is always a, uh, an invitation for identification from the, from the writer to the reader. And then she invites you to watch in horror, she's imagining this, as, and I quote, the door closes behind whoever has wheeled you into the gas chamber. And this is the only time that she invokes in the story the Nazi undertaking of massive euthanasia of people with disabilities and people with ethnic identities that the Nazis had selected for elimination. It's the only time that she actually invokes the Holocaust in this and does so in this rather tightly constructed conversation with her sister and makes Beth do the imagining. So she stays out of that fairly carefully. And I'm showing here the main gas chamber, uh, the gas chamber um, in the main camp at Auschwitz as an illustration to this imaginative invitation to imagine yourself wheeled into a gas chamber. Assuming the narrative voice again, Johnson refuses Peter Singer exceptionality. His logic of killing disabled people is a virulent version of prejudicial thinking about disability that is widely held across society. So he's not a monster. Defining, and I quote Johnson, Singer's kind of disability prejudice as an ultimate evil, she says, and him as a monster would make monsters of many of the people with whom I move on the sidewalks, do business, break bread, swap stories, and share the grunt work of local politics, close quote. She thus ends this reparative narrative, to use Sedgwick's term, from a voice of largesse toward Singer and toward the world. The ethical work, I want to assert, of Johnson's story then, is to narrate disability presence. And she says, I'm quoting, I'll invoke the muck and the mess and the undeniable reality of disabled lives well lived. That's an important quote. This reality contradicts the prejudicial understandings of what disabilities scholar Alison Kaper has called our grim imagined futures. And of course, it is a grim imagined future that is the premise of Singer's utilitarian philosophy. 
Johnson's narrative of the presence rather than the absence of disabled people rejects the liberal eugenics of enhancement, improvement, and the range of technological interventions to erase disability from the human condition. It provides for us a model of Nancy Mayer's habitable world, a model that want a world that wants me in it. And I'll end there. Thank you very much.
sort of in, in the sense of a sort of grim singer view of the way in which uh, technology can be mobilized um, for negative means and the way in which technology can also be repaired and restorative. Uh, but I wonder what, in the sense of technology also creating a problem of an illusion for both the, the disabled and non-disabled that lives are lived independently instead of interdependently. And I wonder what your thoughts might be on that. Well, thank you for asking that. Um, interdependence is really one of the themes of uh, Harriet McBride Johnson's story here. Um, I also showed a slide of uh, the cover of her book, which is a collection of <coughs> these personal essays. Uh, and this piece is in that collection. It's called, I love the title, it's called Too Late to Die Young, in which she, uh, I think very effectively, casts being born with a fairly significant disability or acquiring it early on as actually a great advantage in imagining an open future. So part of the rationale for why people with disabilities are understood as having a lower quality of life is that it is understood that disability is a closing down of future alternatives and future possibilities. And Johnson really works hard at saying, at showing that disability or the human variations we think of disability, which is how I like to talk about it in, in many ways, is an opportunity for resourcefulness. It's not a closing down, but it's rather an opening up. And part of that understanding is that what living as a with a disability, the, the experience of disability, helps us understand as human beings is the myth of independence and autonomy, and helps us understand the fundamental interdependence of all, not just people, but all living things. That was one thing I was trying to invoke with the environmentalist critique um, that argues for um, biodiversity as itself a positive thing because we're all connected to one another in this shared environment. So I'm trying to pull from one kind of ethical discourse and put it into another one. I'm Mary Tripsis, and I'm a professor over at the Carroll School of Management, so I really feel a bit like a fish out of water. Oh, we need you, folks. Uh, I, this is absolutely fascinating, so thank you so much. So my question relates a little bit to the gentleman from the history department in the sense that I study organizations that develop new technologies, and some of them are technologies that might be very helpful to people with disabilities, but I must admit that in my phrasing of it that way, very helpful to there's a value judgment that I want to bring you technology that makes you know, you, someone disabled more like, uh, you know, quote, normal, whatever that means, people. So um, there are some folks, for instance, in, uh, in business schools who've looked at the debate over cochlear implants and right. are those meant to, you know, do those help people or not? But I guess my broader question for you is, is this something that you even thought about, which is how should we as people teaching future managers and leaders help them to think about these issues. You know, we have courses in corporate social responsibility, but in all honesty, those courses are really focused on don't pollute the environment kinds of things, right? And is this something that we should be you know, raising? And if so, how would you think about it? You, we all should be raising it, but you really should be raising it because um, what I think is the work of disability bioethics, uh, I, maybe I didn't say this part, but I'm trying to imagine, uh, so we have disability theory, and disability bioethics might be an applied version of disability theory. I'm trying to develop an applied version of disability bioethics, and it's I'm calling it disability cultural competence. Cultural competence is a term that is known in 
medicine and medical training, but also in the corporate world, as a, a kind of consciousness raising um, initiative to increase diversity and tolerance. Um, so technology is a really important part of disability cultural competence and cultural proficiency. And my argument is that we should all um, have disability cultural competence because we're going to all need it one way or another sometime. But in terms of technology, I think the best way to frame it is that all human beings use technology. And they use technology to extend, I call it, their flesh into the world. Um, and the particular situation, literally, of people with disabilities is that we have to exist in a world that is not built for us. It is built for what is sometimes called a majority body. And so even though all people use technology, for example, these chairs are technology, this microphone is technology, you know, not just computers, but everything, they're all built things and designed things are pieces of technology. But the particular difficulty that people with disabilities have is that the technologies are not generally built for us. So what helps, I think, is to point out that misfit between the exit and normative technologies and people with disabilities. Um, and to then talk about how technologies can work for everybody, people with disabilities as well as non-disabled people, to kind of dissolve that border a little bit. And there are some great examples, of course, like a curb cut, for example, which is a piece of technology that was developed by federal mandate to make the built environment, the public space, more accessible for wheelchair users. But as we know, the curb cut and the ramp, the whole United States is ramped now. And it's ramped because of federal laws. But everybody uses those ramps. So the bicyclists, you know, wheeled suitcases, evolved as a result of the ramping of the United States. And so we all use the ramps. So we're all benefiting from the technologies that were developed uh, to make disabled people be able to enter into the public space, space and use the world um, in the way that non-disabled people were generally able to do so. So that's the framing that I think is most useful. And there are all sorts of examples. I use talk to text technology, for example, because keyboards are not my friends, I can tell you that. Um, and of course, now we're beginning to use that, all of us, and we will all end up using uh, dictation technologies because it, it actually works for some, under some circumstances, much better than um, the kind of dinosaur <coughs> keyboard that many of you all are tied to, that we actually don't really use anymore. Uh, last question. Which is right. 
but medicine is also in the business of unmaking disabled people. So the work of medicine is to treat the human variations that we think of as disability and to provide care for all people. So these human variations that we think of as disabilities are generally viewed within the institution of medicine as pathological variations. And sometimes that's useful and sometimes it's not, but that's the understanding. I think it's very important for us um, as people, people, whether we identify as disabled or non-disabled, not to think of medicine as our enemies but rather to understand that all people, regardless of their ability status, if you will, have a right to medical care and appropriate treatment. Sometimes the treatment that is deemed appropriate by medicine is actually not the best and most effective treatment for a person with a disability. And navigating that and negotiating that is the work of bioethicists, but it's also the work of patients. So there's much to be done. Medicine is not our enemy. But this kind of understanding of disability conservation, if you will, if that's a useful concept, is something that medicine could probably use to appreciate more fully. On that note, um, one announcement before we have an opportunity to thank you is that uh, Rosemary's books are on sale in the back of this room, and she will be located in the front of this room to sign any of your uh, books that you buy. Um, but on behalf of Boston College and the Park Street series, we're really very grateful.